<laughs> Let's pray. I'm going to pray in Hebrew. Avinu Malkeinu, anakta modim laha, shanakta yeholim lavo bifnecha, levekesh mimha, tishpoch lechecha aleinu, vetiftak yet enam shalano, let the feret shal vrecha, ana adonai tehi yetzleinu, let the feret shalcha, b'shem Yeshua adonainu, amen. Don't ask me why it's easier for me to pray in Hebrew, it just is. <laughs> when I'm tired, I always pray in Hebrew, because it's easier than English. Anyway, this is our last one for Christmas. You ready, Sergio? Very good. There's a question I ask myself every day of my life. Every day of my life as a believer, I ask myself this question. It's something I literally, quite actually and sincerely, without exaggeration, it's something I think about every single day of my life as a believer in Jesus. And it's something I've been thinking about as a believer for more than 25 or 30 years. There's not a day goes by that I don't think about this. How could it be? Now remember, my family's a mixture of Jew and Gentile. I see both sides. I see the church from the Jewish perspective, and I see the Jews from the perspective of the Gentile church. I see both. I, I went to the Jewish Community Center and the Catholic school. I have Catholic family and Jewish family. My children, of course, born, born in Galilee and Israel. But I understand Christianity from both a Jewish perspective and a non-Jewish perspective at the same time. This is a question I ask myself continually. Why is it? How is it? How could such a thing possibly be? that the Jews are the people of God. They're the covenant people of God. How could it be that the covenant people of God, and remain so according to the New Testament, the Romans 11, how could it be that as the covenant people of God, being the custodians of the scripture, the New Testament teaches that to them belongs the oracles of God, known as the, the people of the book, Expecting the Messiah to come, their whole existence as a race and a people is predicated upon the messianic promise. That's their raison d'etre. That's the reason they exist, that God would give the scriptures through them and send the Messiah to reconcile fallen man back to himself. How could they have that heritage? How could they have those scriptures? How could they be the custodians of God's truth, indeed the human authors of it? How could they expect the Messiah to come? How could that possibly be? And only a small percentage of them have ever believed in their own Messiah. Much the same as only a small percentage of them have ever believed the warnings of their own prophets. Or a small percentage of them did not rebel against Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses in the wilderness. And then when you look at the history of the church, they do the same things. Not since the early centuries of Christianity have true, regenerate, saved believers ever been anything more than a small remnant. You think the same as only a small remnant of Jews have ever believed in Jesus. Well, actually, in this first and second century, it was a significant percentage. But since that time, only a very small percentage, basically. You go back to the Dark Ages. The believers, most of them were in England. At one point, they were called the Lollards. They were following John Wycliffe. And they were being hunted down and murdered by the established church or the, or the Waldensians in, in, in Western Europe. They were, they were hunted down and murdered. Or the, the, the followers of John Hus, the Bohemian Brethren. They were hunted down and murdered. There's never been anything more, before the Reformation certainly, there'd never been anything more than a small percentage of people professing to be Christians who were regenerate, who were born again, who were biblically Christians, who really believed. It. They've never been anything more than a remnant. Even since the Reformation, the numbers increased, but truly saved believers today? And even within what's called evangelicism, those who are faithful, who've not gone down the ecumenical road, 
or the money preaching road or the interfaith road or the same sex agenda road, they're, they're a remnant. They're even a remnant within evangelicism. The same as there's always been a remnant of Jews, there's always been a remnant of non Jews. So, how could the Jews be this? Have all that and not see it? Well, my wife was a new believer in Jerusalem. I led her to the Lord before she was my wife. Um, she was a student at Hebrew University, as I at one time was. And she led this Israeli guy named uh, Sasson to the Lord. She led him to the Lord. But all she had to do with Sasson was show him in Hebrew how Jesus fulfilled the messianic prophecies of the Tanakh, the Old Testament. All she had to do was show him that he was the Messiah, and then the guy believed and he was prayed and he, and he got saved. That's all she had to do. Then she met some Arab Christian girls who were in the university dormitories. These were Arab Christians. And she told them, but Jesus died for our sins. Oh yes, we know. But he rose from the dead. Oh yeah, we, we, we know that. She as a Jew could not understand how people could know that and even intellectually believe it and not be born again. How can you see this and believe it and not be saved? She couldn't get it as a Jew. Okay, Non-Jews didn't see that he fulfilled these prophecies. But how could Christians who say he did fulfill these prophecies see it and believe it and not be saved, not be regenerate, not be truly born again? Very confusing to <laughs> The Jews are blind and the church is blind. Everybody's blind. What a mess. What a mess. Then there's the faithful people of God, Jew and Gentile, who by the grace of God do see. But it's only by his grace and mercy that we can be counted among them. <laughs> We're no better than the others. Not in and of ourselves. How can the Jews have had all of this? They were holding all the cards. They had the scriptures. When Herod called upon the high priest to explain where the Messiah would be born, they knew it was Bethlehem. They knew from Micah too. They actually had an intellectual knowledge of the prophecies. They actually knew the prophecies. And they still weren't ready. And so the question I ask myself every day, how could so few Jews be ready and so many not, having all that truth? Now, it's the same thing. From the time of Abraham to the time of Jesus, 2,000 years. 2,000 is a long time. God spent 2,000 years working with Israel to get them ready for the first coming of the Messiah. Now, from the time of Jesus to our time, it's another 2,000 years. Just think, God was dealing with Israel from the time of the patriarchs to the time of the birth of Jesus, the nativity. 2,000 years, just as long as he's dealing with the church. Just as long. And what do you wind up with? Most Christians are not ready for the return of Jesus. <coughs> Even most evangelicals are probably not. You've actually, again, we've pointed this out, Rick Warren teaching people to avoid prophecy. Brian Broderson, Calvary Chapel, telling people he's going the same way now. Calvary Chapel, the movement basically is split over this, over Brian Broderson going away from what Chuck Smith taught. The Calvary Chapels have split over Brian. That should be nobody's surprise who knew Brian Broderson, but they split over it. Just keep away and you know, beat the prophecy drum a little lower. And, you know, Rick Warren, keep away from it. It's a diversion. But Jesus said, be alert, watch for this stuff. No, keep away. Tragic. So we're in the same situation for the second coming as the church that Israel was for the first coming. The question. What kind of Jews were ready for the first coming? And what kind of Christians will be ready for the second? 
Once we know what kind of Jews were ready for the first coming of Jesus, we will know exactly what kind of Christians will be ready for his return. If you want to know what kind of people professing to be Christians are going to be ready for the second coming of Christ, what we have to look at is what kind of Christians are akin to the Jews who were ready for his first coming. The kinds of Jews ready for his first coming tell us exactly what kind of Christians are going to be ready for his return. But before that is the other question, or the other factor. What kind of Christians are not going to be ready for his return? <laughs> That's just as easy. What kind of Jews were not ready for his first coming? Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Matthew. Again, on Wednesday, we did the introduction, and we looked in depth at the Magi and how his first coming is a type of his second. But let's look at Matthew chapter 2. Now after Yeshua, Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. In the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who had been born king of the Jews? I refer you back to Wednesday's teaching, part one. For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. The prophecy of Numbers chapter 24. They followed the star predicted in Numbers 24, and when Herod the king heard it, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he began to inquire of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they said, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it had been written by the prophet. Herod, the political leader, as we looked at, a major type of the Antichrist on Wednesday. But all Jerusalem with him. All Jerusalem. The average Jew did not want their own Messiah to come. Mark my words. In popular Christendom, the average person claiming to be a Christian, Catholic or Protestant. They may say the prayer, thy kingdom come. The last thing in the world they want is for his kingdom to come. Amen. That's the last thing in the world they want is for his kingdom to come. And then he gathers together the chief priests and scribes. The scribes of the Sophrim, the theologians of the day. They had an intellectual knowledge of the scriptures. They had a head knowledge of prophecy. It was all in their head. They actually had the right doctrinal theology in the head. But not in the heart. If it is here, if it's in the heart, it is relatively easy for God to put it in the head. <laughs> Somebody with a right heart before the Lord, they may be in ignorance, they may even be in error, but if they love the Lord and seek him, one way or another, providentially or otherwise, God is going to show them and by his spirit, enlighten them to see the truth. Sincere people in dodgy churches or false churches, but they love the Lord. It's easy for God to show people like that. That church is wacky. Those money preachers are con artists. The church of Rome is the whore of Babylon and Christian masquerade. Get out of it. It's relatively easy for God to show people that. 
How many people here used to be in what you now know from the scriptures by the Holy Spirit was a false church and the Lord told you to get out of it? Put your hand up. Look around. It's easy. You might not have understood why it was wrong or how it was unscriptural. You might not have known anything. But if the heart is right, it's easy for God to show people who have a right heart. If the heart is right, it's easy for God to put it here if it's here. But having it here does not necessarily mean it's here. It may be an indication of it. Amen. It may be an indication that it's also here. But it doesn't prove it. Remember what Paul said about love? If I speak all mysteries and I know all these things, but I don't have the one. Remember, somebody persisting in false doctrine proves their heart is wrong. Someone persisting in false doctrine will prove somebody's heart is wrong if they don't come out of it. But having right doctrine does not automatically prove their heart is right. It may be an indication of it. For sure, it may be an indication of it. But it's not prima facie proof. These guys had the right doctrine. They knew it. The political establishment and the religious establishment did not want him to come. When Antichrist shows up, and he will be in that character of Herod, I refer back to Wednesday's teaching, how the Romans proclaimed him to be king of the Jews, they will have a vested interest in perpetuating the status quo for their own aggrandizement. The mainstream religious establishments will be in league with the world and its politicians and whoever and have a vested interest in the perpetuation of the status quo. Don't expect much from the mainstream leadership. I've been warning about these things. Oh, believers wouldn't do that. I don't want to flog the dead horse proverbially. But there's a book called The Divine Principle, written by a man who was a Korean antichrist who actually claimed to be the return of Jesus, the Lord of the Second Advent, Sun Young Moon, who said his wife was the Holy Spirit and that Jesus Christ failed in his mission. He's come to succeed where Jesus failed and he wrote this book, The Divine Principle, and he had a mind control cult based on getting money out of people by slave labor, what amounted to slave labor, by brainwashing people with this divine principle. The guy is finally indicted and convicted in federal court, sent to prison. Tim LaHaye tries to organize 300 major evangelical leaders to volunteer for federal prison in solidarity with Moon, a man who says he's the return of Jesus and that Jesus Christ failed and his wife is the Holy Spirit. This was Tim LaHaye. And all Tim LaHaye's cronies, Thomas Ice, said that they went along with it. I'm only stating a fact. I'm not slinging mud. I'm stating a fact. Public. He gives $2.3 million to Liberty University and Jerry Falwell embraces him as an unsung hero. And Hinson and all the, the Jerry Falwell's cronies go along with it. This is an open, self-confessed antichrist. And people who are born-again believers, major evangelical leaders, because of a vested interest that was political and financial, supported them. That's what happened in the first coming of Jesus. That's what's happening in his second coming. There's a reason you've got guys like John MacArthur saying it's going to be possible to take the mark of the beast, worship the Antichrist, and still be saved. You wonder how it could have happened in the first coming? It's happening in the second coming. I'm not making this up. When you understand it, it's frightening. When you understand it, it's frightening. 
The same with the Maccabees. When you see this agenda, it's, have, it's frightening. Let's look. Well, what kind of Jews were ready? Luke chapter 1, verse 5, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Aviah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elisheba. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in the commandments and requirements of the Lord. I know individual clergymen like Zacharias. Not infrequently like him, but not always, men of the older generation. But not all of them. Some of them are younger. But many of them from the older generation like him. They have godly wives who have been helpmates to them in the ministry for many years. They see the corruption and heresy and their hearts are broken. They remain righteous and devout. I know Pentecostal ministers like that who were sickened by Pensacola and Toronto. I know Baptists like that who were sickened over what McGoth is doing and teaching. I even know Anglicans like that. I know people in these churches and denominations, faithful clergy. They're in a bad system, and they know it. Sometimes they wonder what they're doing there. Sometimes, frankly, I wonder what they're doing there. Maybe God has told them to stay there until such point as they get thrown out, which they eventually will. But no matter how corrupt these denominations and religious systems become, some people will remain faithful always. Remember when Jesus came the first time, the Sadducees had gone into what we would today call theological liberalism. They denied the resurrection. They denied the supernatural. They denied the angelic. They denied, they denied the afterlife, basically. Okay. Yet they were in control of the temple. When Jesus healed the leper, he said, go show yourself to the high priest as a testimony. He never invalidated what God had ordained in his word because of the corruption of the clergy. <laughs> okay. He just said the clergy were corrupt. <laughs> he never invalidated what God had ordained. There are people in these churches that are faithful. There are. Now a time will come when it will become impossible for them to stay in it. Revelation 18.4, come out of her, my people, lest you participate in her sins and share in her plagues. Much the same as it's no longer, it was, it's not possible to be, for instance, in the Roman Catholic Church and not sin. You cannot practice Roman Catholicism without sinning against God because it requires that you believe in the Eucharist, which is idolatry, transubstantiation, that you deny the sufficiency of the Atonement, he has to continue to die sacramentally. Every time they pray to the dead, they're engaging in the sin of necromancy. It's impossible to practice Roman Catholicism and not be an idolater and a necromancer and to believe a false gospel. You, can't, you cannot be a Roman Catholic and not, and not practice sin. It requires that you sin. That will become true. Before Jesus comes, that will become true of much, maybe most, of mainstream evangelicism. March, mark my words. That will become true of much of mainstream evangelicism, if not most, before he comes. Mark my words. It's always been true of Rome. It's always been true of liberal Protestantism. Let's look. Zechariah and Elisheba. 
Then we have a nice Jewish girl, Miriam. I love Miriam. Blessed are you among women. Nice Jewish girl from the Holy Land. I married a nice Jewish girl from the Holy Land myself. I'll be seeing her in a few days in New York. Anyway, we have Miriam. Not Mary, Miriam. The root meaning of her name implies bitterness, like the sister of Moses, because of Simeon's prophecy. This is the greatest woman who ever lived. God Almighty is going to become literally and physically incarnated inside of your body, and you are going to be the earthly mother of the Savior who will save his people from their sin. This is the greatest woman who ever lived. The greatest, probably no more than 15 or so. This is the greatest woman who ever lived. Gabriel from the book of Daniel shows up and tells her, you're the greatest woman who ever lived. What is the greatest, and this goes back to the Song of Deborah, as we looked at the other night from Judges 5, the Magnificat God comes from the Song of Deborah. Can you imagine? You're going to be the mother of the Messiah who's going to be God in human form, and he's going to save his people from their sin, and you're going to be his mother? Blessed are you among women, the greatest woman who ever lived. What's the first words out of her mouth? I love this. Luke 1, 46, Medium said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Your baby's going to save his people from their sin. My spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Now, if the greatest woman, the greatest woman who ever lived, says she needs to be saved from sin, where does that put the rest of us? Either I believe the greatest woman who ever lived, or you believe that antichrist liar in Rome who teaches Munificentissimus Deus, no, Mary conceived without sin. If the greatest woman who ever lived tells me she needs to be saved from sin, I believe her. I don't think for one-tenth of one second the greatest woman who ever lived would lie to us. But even if she did, which she obviously wouldn't, and obviously didn't, but even if she had, God certainly would not have put it in his word. <laughs> Two people we have to think of. Yochanan Hamadbil, John the Baptist, and Miriam. This is the greatest man who ever lived, apart from Jesus. None born among women is greater than John, as we looked at the other night, on Wednesday, in the introduction. The greatest man who ever lived. The law and prophets are preached to John. None born among women is greater than John. And he says he's not worthy to tie Jesus' bootlace. And then Mary, the greatest woman who ever lived. <laughs> and both of them know that in comparison to him, they're nothing. This is the meaning of poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Unless someone can come to terms with their own spiritual bankruptcy, they cannot get saved. <laughs> if the greatest man who ever lived and the greatest woman who ever lived needed to be saved, where does that put the rest of us who aren't so great? That's quite a thing, isn't it? 15-year-old, young kid, whatever she was, <laughs> Probably mid-teens. My soul rejoices in God, my Savior. You are the greatest woman who ever lived. This is Gabriel from the book of Daniel. You are the greatest are you among women. Oh. oh, boy. My soul rejoices in God, my Savior. 
That's the kind of Jew who is ready for the first coming of Jesus. That's the kind of Christian going to be ready for him to come back. Then there was her boyfriend. Her boyfriend, a git Yiddish kint, as we'd say in Yiddish, a nice Jewish boy. Nice Jewish boy named Yosef, God shall add. I was fortuitous that his name was Joseph. We have two pictures of the Messiah in Judaism, as most of you know. Hamashiach ben Yosef and Hamashiach ben David, Messiah, son of Joseph and of David. Joseph in Genesis prefiguring the Messiah. The Messiah would come in the character of Joseph, betrayed by his own people to the hands of Gentiles, and God takes the betrayal, turning it around, making it a way to bring salvation. We have a teaching tape dealing with this. One Messiah, two comings. So it's fortuitous, providential that Mary's fiance's name was Joseph Yosef. And it says he was righteous and just. <laughs> In a Jewish wedding of the Second Temple period, the wedding had three phases. There was betrothal, which generally took place around Passover time. Then there was the nuptial, about a year later. But she wouldn't know the day or the hour, she just knew it would be in the night, and she would watch for the changing flora as the signs that he was coming closer. This is the imagery of the Song of Solomon and the background to Matthew 25 and Matthew 19. This betrothal, however, was legally binding. It's like in some countries where they don't recognize legal, there's no legal recognition of a church wedding. You have to go to a registry office or justice of the peace, and then go to a church, okay, and, and do the religious ceremony. Well, it's like that, only there was a year or so in between the two. The betrothal was legally binding. It was not an engagement per se. It was the contractual phase of the wedding. Followed by the nuptial, as in his banner over me, his love, followed by the consummation. And so you had... Uh, Three phases, okay. In the first phase was the engagement, was consecration. The second phase of the wedding was convocation with the witnesses, the nuptial. The third phase was consummation. For the wedding to be valid, all three had to take place. There had to be a consecration, which was the betrothal, legally binding. That's why Joseph would have had to divorce Mary. Then there would have had to be a convocation, the witnesses, and then a consummation. We are told that Joseph kept her a virgin until Mary was born. He did not, Ganasco, know her intimately or sexually until after the birth of the Messiah. The second dishonoring of Mary by the Roman church is that she was perpetually a virgin. If Joseph and Mary had an unconsummated marriage, they would not have been legally married by Jewish law. <laughs> They were, just, they were just shacking up. <laughs> amazing. Absolutely amazing. Joseph would have had to divorce her. Now, he wouldn't have understood the prophecy of Isaiah 7.14, the virgin shall conceive, that we looked at on Wednesday in the introduction. He wouldn't have understood it beyond a limited point, certainly. All he could have possibly known, the only thing he could have possibly known was that there was infidelity. The only thing he could have possibly imagined was that Miriam had slept with somebody other than him before the nuptial. That's all he could have reasonably known. And instead of throwing a fit, <laughs> he tries to keep a lid on it, protect her dignity. <laughs> just like the sons of Noah when he got, went out and got loaded and they put, tried to cover his nakedness. Remember, nakedness in the Bible is not the beach in Maui. The nakedness in the Bible is not having the garments of salvation. They tried to cover it up. Well, he tried to protect her dignity. He tried to keep a lid on it. Uh, this, this is a gracious man. A gracious man. He tried to cover what he thought was her sin. Of course, there was no sin, but he didn't know that. He had no way of expecting or believing anything other. 
He says he was righteous and just. Can you imagine a guy hurt like that? As far as he knew, to have been hurt that this, 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 this woman you love and you want to spend your life with and you believe God has joined you to her, and then, then she comes and tells you that she's pregnant and then you know you're not the father. What that would do to him, he'd want to... <laughs> puts her first, despite the fact that as far as he knew, she wronged him grievously, as far as he knew. He was the victim, but he still put her first even though she had hurt him, as far as he was aware. This was a gracious guy. This was a gracious, gracious man, wanting to see the sin of others covered. Of course, there was no sin. But he didn't know that. That's a nice Jewish boy. That is the Git Yiddish Kint. Really Hamisha. In Yiddish, we'd call them Hamisha. Hamisha is like a Jewish homeboy. <coughs> well, let's go on. So we have a young couple. Then we have some other people. Yeah. Verse 25 of chapter 2 in Luke. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. While all Jerusalem was mourning with Herod, he was longing for the coming of Jesus. Before the day of Pentecost, of course, as most of you know, the Holy Spirit was only for certain people at certain times. High priests, kings, prophets, judges, and patriarchs. It wasn't like now. Only unique people have the Holy Spirit at certain times. Simeon was one of them. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit He'd not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. <coughs> this guy had what the New Testament would call the gift of faith. By revelation of the Holy Spirit, he was able to trust God for something not specifically declared in Scripture. We, can, we all have a measure of faith. We can take God at his word. We can trust him for salvation. Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. You can take him at his word. But the gift of faith is where, not your imagination or wishful thinking, but the Holy Spirit has revealed something to you that you know is going to be, and you hold on to it. This is the gift of faith. Not everybody has the gift of faith. We all have a measure of faith, but the gift of faith is something else. Sometimes there's people we, who are intercessors, who, 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 who are, people who are in intercessory prayer, or very often people who have the gift of faith. They just pray because they know the victory is going to be there. The Lord has revealed it to them. We have, no matter what it looks like, circumstantially, we have to persist in this. No, this is another thing. Now, we all have faith, but these people have the gift of faith. Well, Simeon, I just think this guy, his hair is going, his teeth are going, his eyesight's going, he can't get a date. <laughs> God only knows what else is wrong with him. But he knows he's not going to check out before Jesus comes. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere <laughs> until the Messiah comes. And he came in the spirit into the temple. In verse 27, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law. Well, that's quite a thing, circumcision on the eighth day. But look at this. In verse 23, as it is written in the Torah of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that was said in the law of the Lord a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. 
if Joseph and Mary had been people of means, of wealth, they would have bought a spring lamb. This was the poor person's offering. There was a con artist money preacher from the United States named John Avanzini who came to Great Britain to open his British office and some people from our ministry went to the grand opening that he attempted to have and asked him. He gave his usual spiel how Joseph was rich and Mary was rich and Jesus had a rich man's robe and his family was wealthy and God wants you wealthy the whole bit. And, and he, this guy, this guy was obviously he was unbelievable. He, he said, now look at the widow's mite. He gave her last penny. It says she gave him her, her, gave him her want. You see, she gave because she wanted to get something. <laughs> He has to take the King James because it says from her want. But that's not what it says or means in Greek. It means she gave her what she really couldn't afford to give by faith. Unbelievable. And people believe him and give him money. So he came and he went through this whole thing about Jesus was rich and his family was rich. And my friend's wife, my, she asked him, she's my friend, and she asked him, well, then, if they were rich, how come Mary bought a poor person's offering instead of a wealthy person's offering when Jesus was born? They were freaked out. They had her ushered out of the auditorium. <laughs> Quite a thing. And he took him, in verse 28, into his arms and blessed the Lord and said, now, Lord, thou dost let thy bondservant depart in peace according to thy word. My eyes have seen thy salvation. Now, his name is Yeshua, right? In Hebrew, thy salvation, Yeshua Techa, your Yeshua. Thy salvation, Yeshua Techa. Aramaic would have been similar. Probably spoken Aramaic would have been almost the same. And thou hast prepared in the presence of all the peoples the light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And his father and mother were amazed at the things that were being said about him. And then Simeon's prophecy. He blessed them and said to Miriam, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel, a sign to be opposed and a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that the thoughts and hearts of many may be revealed. Now, of course, a sword would pierce your own heart looking ahead to the crucifixion that would precede the resurrection. Again, her name, Miriam, the bitterness. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Manuel of the tribe of Asher, there is a ridiculous nonsense begun in Great Britain that gained momentum in the United States. It began in Great Britain after Benjamin Disraeli, a Jew, became prime minister of Great Britain who was a Christian. And he was a saved Christian, quite certainly, when we look at the things he said and wrote. He also kept Britain out of the American Civil War despite pressure to enter the war on the side of the South because he was against slavery. In any event, because they had a Jewish prime minister when Britannia ruled the waves and Britain was the superpower, they had this idea that the British people are the ten lost tribes, which is complete nonsense. The ten tribes were never lost, according to the Mishnah and according to the book of Ezra and Second Chronicles and according to the New Testament. James writes his epistle to the twelve tribes, doesn't he? Well, we see here that Anna was from the tribe of Asher. During the revivals of King Asa and, and the good kings in Judah, the faithful people of Israel, the ten northern tribes, came south, and they brought their tribal identities with them. Others came back with the Jews from the Babylonian captivity, who'd gone into the Assyrian captivity, came back. This is recorded by Ezra, and it's recorded in Ezra and Chronicles. They were never lost. But there's this myth, British Israelism, you had this cult in America called the Worldwide Church of God, Armstrongism. 
Garner, Ted Armstrong, and the, 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 one was the father, one was the son. It was called Armstrongism. Now, a lot of them have gotten saved after Armstrong died, praise God. They have a guy named Koch or something. Koch, he, he's a true believer. Um, but the, Armstrongism was crazy. This Anglo-Israelism was absolutely crazy. We see Asher, we see that, that Anna was from the tribe of Asher. The daughter of Fanuel of the tribe of Asher, they've got this whole thing of how the, the, the stone of Scone and the, the royal throne of Britain is the throne of David and all this, it's crazy. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And then as a widow to the age of 84, that was an extremely old age then. Like the Apostle John, the Lord gave her an abnormal longevity for his purposes. Okay. To the age of 84, and she never left the temple serving night and day with fastings and prayer. And at the very moment she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak of him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. All Jerusalem mourned, but there were still those in it looking for the redemption. She was a widow to the age of 84, having been married in her youth for seven years. And her whole life was just serving God and praying. That's all she did. That's all she lived for. This little old lady. I'm telling you, you see a missionary or an evangelist or a pastor who God is blessing and using, and he has a huge church and tons of people are getting saved and all of that stuff. Well, praise God for that pastor or that evangelist or that missionary. When we get to heaven, you're going to find out it was the little old lady who washed the church steps, <laughs> who prayed for that pastor every day. And said, they are the real dynamos. They look frail and their hair is gray. They are the real dynamos. There's little old ladies like that who pray for me. I thank God for every one of them. I probably wouldn't be alive today, let alone be preaching today, if it wasn't for such little old ladies. Thank God for these little old ladies. All she wanted to do was tell people about Jesus. I know little old ladies like that. I've met lots of them. Yes, and I've met Simeons, and so have you. An old brother like Simeon. Older believers have experience. They have things. So many of the important people in Scripture who God used the most didn't begin doing it until retirement age. Moses was 80. The Apostle John wrote Revelation when he was close to 100, over 90. Simeon and Anna, they were elderly. Unfortunately, many Christians have bought into the world's lie of retirement. No, no. There is no retirement for a Christian. Being a believer is like being in the mafia. The only way you get out is once you're in, you know too much. The only way you get out is in a concrete kimono. Let me tell you how God views retirement. When you're younger and you're putting kids through university and paying off the mortgage and building a business or a professional practice or, or a trade or something like that, yeah, you're busy. You go to church once, twice a week, maybe give somebody a track, this, that, the other thing. The day you retire, God says, let me congratulate you on your retirement. Now you work for me full time. <laughs> It's the icing on the cake. You can't get out of this racket. <laughs> it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, there's no discharge from war. <laughs> we have Simeon and Anna, Miriam and Joseph, Zacharias and Elisheva, but there's more. Chapter 2 of Luke, verse 8. In the same region, there were some shepherds. 
staying out in the fields and keeping watch over the flock by night. Remember, it gets very dark before Jesus comes. He's coming like a thief in the night. The angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them. An angel. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terribly frightened. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news. In Greek, evangelion. Evangelion. In Hebrew, besora. In English, gospel. I bring you the gospel of a great joy which shall be for all the people. Today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You'll find the baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. Now, again, on our teaching tape, The Strength of the Ox, we deal with the typology and symbolism of why Jesus was in the manger. And there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, Hatseva Ota Shamaim, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men of goodwill. And it came about when the angels had gone away from them into the heaven that the shepherds began saying to one another, let's go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. And they made haste and they found Mary, Joseph, and the baby and the child and all who had wondered the things that were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured these things in her hearts and the shepherds were there. Well, it's going to happen again. <clears throat> and the shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. Poeon and episkipo, two Greek words for shepherd, also words for pastor. Yes, it is getting dark, and it will get darker before the Lord comes. But there will be shepherds who will watch their flocks. There will be shepherds that no matter how dark it gets, will guard their flocks. Those are the kinds of Jews ready for the first coming of Jesus. Those are the kinds of Christians going to be ready for him to come again. Many people we think would be or should be, obviously won't be. But there's people who will be. Those looking for the consolation of Israel. Old ladies like Anna, young teenagers like Miriam and Joseph, an old brother like Simeon, a righteous clergyman like Zechariah and his wife, shepherds who watched their flock. Yes, there were Jews who were ready, who went against the grain, who went against the status quo, who really wanted him to come. Like the early Christians, Mar Anata in Aramaic, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Yes. Yes, those are the kinds of Jews ready for the first coming of the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. And those are exactly, exactly the kinds of Christians <coughs> who are going to be ready for him to come again. Those are exactly the kinds of Christians who are going to be ready for him to come again. Just look at the Jews, look at Israel, then look at the church. Those will be the kind who are going to be ready. Every year at this time of year, my prayer for all of us and our families is that by the unmerited grace of the God of Israel, we will be counted among them who are ready. 
my dear brethren in Jesus, Achim Pachayot Be'adon Yeshua. Let us make no mistake about it. Christmas is coming. God bless. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kendall and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon and they're available through Kendall. Kendall. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo. Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available in the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.